Mexican maiden, I was in love, but in vain I could tell. One night a wild young cowboy came in, wild as the West Texas wind. Dancing and daring and drink, he was sharing with wicked Felina, the girl that
at the things that I forgot to do. And all the times I had the chance to I stop my rambling I don't do too much gambling these days I seem to think about how all the changes came about my way and I wonder if I'd be another I don't think I risk another mistake.
tree, tree, what do you think of me? Tree, tree, what do you see when you look at me? Tree, tree, what do you think of me? Tree, tree, what do you see when you look at me? Do I amuse you? Do I confuse you? Running around and around like I'm used to. A fast forward movie played at your feet at repeat, at repeat, at repeat. Tree. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ninka Lavamon. Next to me sits Pruksma. And well, it's 2060. But imagine we would even make a bigger leap into the future. And we could say something to our great grandchildren 100 years from now. What would we say? Hello there, this is your ancestor speak, your predecessor from the 21st century, when you emerged repressing me, remember? That was us, the homo economicus. Don't walk away, please stay, please listen to what I have to say. I know I'm out of favor, out of date. You hate me probably and it's too late to change my fate But please, two minutes for your ancestor The one that went before you I assure you that when you let me explain a little more Of what we went through, what we really meant to do That the intention wasn't evil on our side It might shed a different light 
on how you think of us, your ancestors, so you may learn from us because to not get lost in the future, you must know your past right. So here I am. This is your ancestor speaking, your predecessor from the 21st century. You're blaming me for spreading myself endlessly round the globe, exploiting nature, leaving no hope for a future, driving the earth to the verge of exhaustion, draining her to the bone like a virus, in fact, doing what it loves the most, to multiply and multiply, completely undermining its host. And you're right, in a way. Looking back, I admit that we did, but we weren't aware that we were doing good economic growth for all of you. Comfort and convenience, life is so much easier than it has ever been before. You have to give me that. Of course, I do regret that we've polluted ourselves out of existence, created an unbridgeable distance from all other forms of life until life finally left us. Exit. Homo economicus. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was. And it failed, it couldn't last, I do agree. But in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed, it couldn't last, I do agree. But in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. The point I'm trying to make, we weren't fully awake. We didn't know the things you know. It seemed good to stick with growth. Climate change, we heard the words, but the words just didn't hurt, and it may sound absurd. We loved our children too. We were stuck in a system of business. That's how we survived. It gave us our lives. To buy or not to buy was to be or not to be. Buying things determined our identity. And you can laugh about it now, but remember it was how we managed to get out of poverty and wilderness. Don't call it pure silliness. So we aren't flawless, your great grandparents, but you shouldn't lay it all on us. The homo economicus. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed. It couldn't last, I do agree. But in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed. It couldn't last, I do agree. But in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. So here I am. This is your ancestor speaking. Your predecessor from the 21st century to ask for forgiveness, for some understanding. Please, don't be too demanding. Don't be too hard on us. We did the best we could, moving forward like we thought we should. And though we were just a phase in the existence of the human race, we paved the road for you in many ways. This is your ancestor speaking, the relatives you know so well. Forgive us. Sending you to hell. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed. It couldn't last. I do agree. But in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed. It couldn't last. I do agree. But in the middle of the hustle, the middle of the hustle, you say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed. It couldn't last. I do agree, but in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. You say growth was my holy grail. Yes, it was, and it failed. It couldn't last. I do agree, but in the middle of the hustle, you cannot really see. Welcome everyone to Pathways to Sustainability 2060. I'm Vanessa Timmer, and a big thank you to Nika Lavermann and Sietze Krautsma for getting us started. Our ancestors, that's what we're really talking about today because we're going to go back to the transition 20s and then talk about how we got to April 4th, 2060 today. And you know, a lot has changed. For those of you who've come from far away, you would have also done the thing that's now common sense, come a few days earlier to a conference, just kind of relaxed, 
done a bit of a tour of the place. You know, that's common practice, and it wasn't in the 2020s. And whether you've come from afar or close by, you're most welcome. And I can see that there's a few young, a number of young people in the audience. What was that news a few days ago? Laura Kosk, that artificial intelligence genius, has become the youngest member of the Estonian Governing Council. She was only 21 years of age, and that's not uncommon now. So leadership is happening from all over. So I want to say a big welcome to you to say this morning we're going to hear from a few, a couple of people who will talk us through these transition 20s, what we changed, how we got to April 4th, 2060. We'll hear your thoughts as well before we head into break. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Louis Akenji, the Managing Director of the Hot or Cool Institute, who's working with the United Nations agencies, the U European Commission. He's done a lot of work with the African and Asian Development Banks, and he's a technical and also a policy advisor to national governments, including Finland, Sweden, Hungary, Japan, and Indonesia. And a few years ago, in 2057, he was one of the founders of the Universal Basic Services Program, which we all know so well. So over to you, Dr. Louis Akenji, tell us, how did we get here to 2060? Over to you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I just, I just want to say it was really a privilege experiencing the music, because it wasn't just listening, it was experiencing it. And for those of you born before 2040, you will remember the terrible times when music was composed by AI and sung by automated machines. Thank God we got back to our senses and, uh, yeah, and went back to some decency, some roots, talk to our ancestors. Um, so I, got, I couldn't get a newspaper for this week, but I got the one for last week. So it's a Friday. 25th. But it, it, the news tells of the times that we are in. So for those of you who have been here for a week, if you want to go by Amsterdam, make sure you go to the uh, Cultural Center to see the latest exhibition it has on the crazy 20s and 30s, some of the nasty times we went through. It's, there's a lot of stuff in there. And those you, three jackets from the last time, too, so I'm just going to, yes, All perfect. Right. There we go. <laughs> do I look 2060s? Yes, I do. All right. So. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also a bit of a crazy time because now we have cyber pirates on strike. They are attacking the EU to drop its demands that uh, AI cannot be used by non-state actors. So it's a bit of a wild time we're going through also. But also uh, countries like Costa Rica that have always been at the forefront of what sustainability should be, treating, uh, focusing more on the well-being of their citizens, and now showing how bottom-up governance could really look like. There's a lot more this year. Uh, Holland being very generous and having learned from, you know, the experience of protecting his country against sea level rise, is now offered autonomous region to the Eastern Island people whose island has gone under the sea. So things are getting crazy. And you just heard the news of the 21-year-old AI genius who was uh, uh, appointed on the governing council of Estonia. But it's not all very positive, is it? Remember the crazy 2030s and the 40s when people were experimenting with geoengineering? Now we're seeing some of the consequences right now, and we're not quite sure what direction to take. But how did we get here? How did we get here so fast? And why do things look so radically different? You would remember a time when we talked about biodiversity laws, the climate crisis, something called COVID-19. Pandemics didn't just start this decade. They've been going on for quite a while now, although they've gotten worse and worse. And we just couldn't get our acts together. There was just so much going on that we realized we needed to move away from it. And uh, at a time when the Horoku Institute was really still young and in, and in Berlin, it did this analysis showing lots of things going on. First of all, where we needed to be by 2030, that was three decades ago, and where we needed to be one decade ago. And just because it was so overwhelming, we learned lots of lessons. These are footprints of citizens in G20 countries about four decades ago. What it showed very clearly is the magnitude of reductions that was needed. By the way, this excludes uh, military spending, which is huge, which was huge at the time. Thank God we also came to our senses, and a, a little bit of that is down. But 
Already what you see in some of this was the tension that existed globally. Countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil, where a lot of the resources are, and where they have populations, hundreds of millions of people that they still need to get out of poverty, were busy working, supplying for the appetite of people in these other countries on the other end of the chat. So this social tension on a global scale was manifesting, but also within countries, it became very clear that it was the top 10% that was causing a lot of the problem and shifting the burden to the bottom 50% that were only emitting about 10% uh, of the CO2 emissions that we're complaining about. So the youth got furious. That's my grandma, by the way. The youth got, <laughs> the, the youth got really furious and said, nah, they, they, they're not, we're not gonna take this anymore, right? And we remember through history, there's always been a lot of bloodshed. It's either we change something or the things come and change it. So, of course, we learned lots of lessons. For one, the urgency and the scale of the challenge we were facing did not allow us time to handhold people uh, individually to a sustainable future. But a lot of the solutions that we were attempting were at national level, national government policies, environmental issues at a national level. But the consequences transcended national borders. These artificially created lines that we've, we've developed for ourselves. And uh, political views were also evolve, evolving at a global scale. And we quickly learned, for those of us that worked at the research institutes at the time, that it's not all about technology or just putting out numbers and so on. It was really about our ways of living. And it's not only reductions as we showed in the first slide. We needed to radically change everything. So we started with a few false friends that we had around the time. We, spent, we had spent so much time talking about eco-labels, which was just another way of supporting economic growth. And then the new Trojan horse came. Remember the automobile industry saying, let's all get to electric vehicles, right? And then carbon offsetting, just shift the trouble over to those guys there that we could not see. And ESG, the license we granted to companies to lie to us all the time. And you would remember the time when Hundreds of thousands of people would gather in cities in something called the COP and just kept reinventing the agenda and lying to people. Thank God we've gone past that. So where are we now? We now live in urban villages and there's a lot of rewilding going on in reclaimed spaces that are out there. Uh, there's also now a lot. We've shifted from our very individualistic focus and we have a public luxury now, so lots of public libraries car-free city centers, public recreational facilities, a lot of things. When you get into your home, you, you're quite sufficient and you're living really well, as you would very well know. But when you go outdoors, it's very luxurious and lush. It was not always like that. I'm oh, sorry, I missed uh, one thing. But remember this story of echo labels when we used to force the do-gooders, the people that are actually producing well, to convince us that they're sustainable. And they ended up overwhelming everybody. This was complete nonsense. So we thought, if we've been using public health, social uh, security concerns to edit our certain choices from society, why don't we use sustainability as a criteria? So we flipped the script. Instead of proving that you're a good guy, you, need, you needed to convince everyone that you have to function. You're providing a value. We had the on eco label, which we put on products, which we thought, you're not bringing any value. You're not contributing to our well-being or the well-being of the environment. We had to edit out those things, right? But now everyone, as you know, you spend some of your carbon allowance coming here this morning. That is, of course, because it's become very clear that each one of us has a budget. It's not what's in your credit card. It's not what's in your wallet anymore. It's your CO2 credit. And if you, you can fly wherever you want, but you know, if you fly once, you're not gonna do it for the next five to 10 years. So squander your budget, if you will, and become carbon poor, which means your well-being is also starts going down. So all those consumer loyalty programs, air miles, uh, frequent flyer programs, and so on, they're out now because no one wants to spend their carbon credit on all of that. But we now also have something which you all know because you live in this kind of house. It's called universal basic services. Essentially, we now know that for a few things that are quite fundamental to everyday living, shelter, so that is housing, food, and mobility services, they're not open to profit making anymore. There's no more speculative financial investment in housing. Something so basic that citizens of London, Amsterdam and so on had to go on strike to say you can't be making money off of where we live, right? 
things like healthcare, which used to be quite controversial in a few countries, you know, where are now public and universal. And of course, food is, you can still buy food, of course we still buy food, but the very basic meals are provisioned free of charge. What does the big picture now look like in terms of governance? So I'm going to go through two different scenarios, one, uh, different things that are happening, one at a global level, and another one at a national level. What we used to know as the United Nations Environment Program, and it has now been combined with the UNF C, as you must have heard the news, it's now the UN uh, Council on Ecological Stability. It's not only that it's been brought together, it's also been upgraded to be at a level of what the uh, Security Council used to be, and now there's a legal mandate. So all those useless cops where people used to come together and, and talk and create lots of paperwork and not follow up is becoming very different, right? The second one is global resources, which was such a major source of tension between China and Europe or between African countries and Europe. There's always Europe there somewhere. Nah. Historically, Europeans were a bit of something, yeah? So all of that tension is being reconciled. Instead of allowing global resources to be uh, at, at, uh, exploited at a, and controlled at just a national level, there's a global sort of body that has authority over this, that is rationing, and that is also making sure that all the critical materials that we have are going into valuable uh, use rather than just for profit generation. But we also know that a few other political blocs have become very strong. Um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the Sub-Saharan African Union have joined forces, have all become very powerful in their own right, just as we had the European Union uh, back then. And they've just said, no, you're not going to exploit resources so randomly and exploit us so randomly anymore. And so global governance has become a little bit more balanced and there's a little bit more value in there. Well-being is now driving policy and, and, and not just uh, profiteering, as the, the song put it. But at a national level, what does it look like in the various countries where you come from? We know that citizens are much more active in terms of participatory governance right now. There's strengthened local communities because, of course, we have digital channels. We have ways of getting people more involved in, in governance. But the principle of universality is now commonly applied across policy design. Why? Because I showed the example of what is happening in terms of housing, but that is also happening in terms of food. So things like universal basic income, which we discussed back in the days, it's not, no longer just income anymore. The sense that we all, as human beings, should have a very fair space, a fair playground, and our well-being should be priority rather than the profits of just a few. And for this, there's what is now commonly understood as a fair consumption space for everybody that guides our way of living. This includes not just that people who are over-consuming needed to calm down or need to calm down now, but there's now a social floor below which we don't allow anyone to fall. The thing called poverty has now been recognized as not just financially related, but well-being oriented. And there's a cap on wealth. We know that in no country in the world as the top 10% allowed to own more than 40% of national wealth. In fact, there are some countries discussing that this needs to come down to a maximum of 20%. And our policies are now guided by a well-being direction. We have the uh, Sustainable Well-Being Index and the Social Tension Index, which guide us when each time we get a policy, we ask, is this moving us towards well-being or it's creating more social tension? We want to avoid the revolutions and the bloodshed of the past. And last but not the least, we're rethinking what it means to be a business. Are you actually providing value? Are you generating value to society? Or you're just redirecting resources towards waste and lining the pockets of a few? I think this pretty much sums up a lot of what we now have in the, tw in the uh, 2060s. Three key principles, living within ecological limits, justice and fairness, in terms of access to opportunities for all. And we're guided by well-being, not only of individuals, but collectively as a society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lewis. Well, 
uh, what a, you know, I'm also such a fan of the public luxury. And actually, Lewis, we're going to keep you on stage for a second because we actually have a moment for one question. If we can bring the house lights up a little bit, there's three floors of you, and there's on each floor, there's a microphone. Wonderful. And um, in a moment, we're going to be a bit retro and use Mentimeter. Do you remember that from Transition 20s? It's like a long time ago. We thought we'd be a bit retro today. So that's coming. But for now, we're going to use a microphone. So let's see uh, if there's one person uh, here. Joost Verford, I recognize you. Could you uh, get a microphone over to him here? Thank you. Don't ask a difficult question. <laughs> And from your perspective, Yoast, what's your question around this transition 20s and where we're at in 2060? Not quite yet. I think we're getting there almost. 2060s, uh, you know, we are using the also the retro box here. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I think if we can get a microphone to you, maybe Simone's one that she's got there, we can just bring it over because of the um, live stream as well. That would be great because we've got people joining us from all around the world. And yes. <laughs> we're we're going to. Oh, just a sec. I think we're getting there. This is a moment for us all to take in what we just heard. You know what? I'm coming to you, Yoast. This is what's happening. Because I have a microphone it's that 20, works. It's 2060, people. This is the technology that used to deceive us. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's something to be learned about the, uh, <laughs> Here. the deception that technology carried us through several Okay, I'm going to go on the other side of you. Go ahead. Okay, All right. okay this is very cozy. <laughs> um, uh, so thanks so, so much, Lewis, for the uh, uh, shared walk down memory lane. It was really good to see. Um, but now that we're in 2060 and things are a lot better, I am, uh, it's hard for me to remember what the, the anger was like, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what was the role, you, you mentioned it a bit, but the role of anger and rage and outrage and how it was ultimately used and sort of mobilized, you know, how it really helped to change things uh, and, and didn't stay just uh, undirected. Uh, th thank you so thank much. You. I, I, uh, I, I must tell you, I was born after 2030, but I've read history books about that period. <laughs> and and uh, the, the thing I'm most impressed about, you saw a picture of my grandma, oh, was the, the, the role the youth played in this, right? It, it, essentially, we know that scientists have provided a lot of facts and information over time. Then there was a competition over what the future would look like. Who was competing? The automobile industry or the technology industry, the sustainability sector that was saying we deserve something that is a little bit greener and the banking sector that said it was all about money. So there was a lot of competition over what the future would really look like. And uh, what became very clear is that most, most of the, the scenarios that were offered here were really geared towards supporting the market. And it is when we realized that at the very heart of it is that governments are propping the economy rather than supporting people's well-being that things began to change. It was the youth that said their future, they cannot see any prospects, people like my grandma who went on strike, but it was also people who were beginning to sit in their offices and wondering why they're going there for eight hours a day. What are they really doing? What is the value of all this boredom and computer screens when they're not feeling happy about their work or about their society? And things began to change. And it was people like us who started asking questions very genuinely. What does it mean to live well? And once we got a few questions in place, of course, because governments have been sort of locked into default governance modes, it needed a bit of, uh, uh, I have to say, you've, you've read the news about protests in New York, in Amsterdam, there were even some of them in Utrecht, and people went out on the streets and finally they had to relent. Thank you so much, Lewis. We'll see you back in a minute when we do the uh, question and answer again. Thank you so much. Thank you so Just much, me for in Thanking me. Dr. Lewis again. <laughs> and now we did use some of the Utrecht University uh, um, carbon allowance to actually bring in a very special guest from Accra, Ghana, Dr. Fat Fatima Denton. She's the Prince Klaus Chair on Equity and Development 
at Utrecht University focused on just transitions. She's also at the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, based in Accra, Ghana. And all of you probably know that she's an intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, expert focused on climate and land. But what you might not know is that a few years ago, she became one of the key leads at the intergovernmental regional bodies on climate change that really started in the 2050s and a little bit earlier as well. So over to you, Dr. Fatima Denton, take us on a journey of what you see happened in the transition 20s. Welcome. Thanks a lot, um, Vanessa. So we're in 2060, and I'm actually it's because <laughs> it's a lot easier. Um, okay, so I too wish that we stayed with that poem and the song to some extent. Um, I'm sure my kids would be taking out the scorecards and evaluating me on things that I said right or got wrong um, in 2060. Um, so, a um, couple of things that um, I think is going to be essential in terms of where we are today. Um, let's start with the present. We want to call that present or dystopia. Um, the past as a prologue and um, a reimagined future. So that's my trajectory where I'm headed. Um, in terms of a uh, direction of travel, just to get a sense of um, what sort of bold transformation have we taken now in 2060, what have we missed along the way, and what are some of the changes that we need to make? Um, there's been a few things that might sound a bit redundant um, with um, Louis's um, presentation, but I'll, I'll mention some things that we are celebrating. Um, the Paris Agreement. It's not a big deal now, um, so that's, that's something we're celebrating. I think perhaps in every household, they know what the Paris Agreement means. Um, we have seen a huge reduction of CO2 emissions, so that's also not a, not a big deal. Um, we've reduced um, many of the carbon-intensive sectors, carbon-intensive industries that we've seen. So we're producing in a way that is not as um, polluting as um, previously. So that's a huge deal. Um, some of the countries in Africa, for instance, that have been very much um, a poster child of poverty, Ethiopia is an example, um, are now major producers of wheat. Um, so they're no longer um, depending on Ukraine or Russia for their wheat. Um, and then the technologies as well, um, lithium-ion batteries. These are produced in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwe has become um, the leading producer. And renewable energy, it's not a thing of the past anymore. Um, no, I mean, not, not something that's a big innovation. It's something that we all, we all have in our houses and, and, and um, et cetera. So these are things that we can celebrate. Geopolitically, 2060, the war's over. Um, the PAD dependency um, that, you know, has been very much part of Africa's story, that's no longer the case. Um, we're not on that sort of extractive um, pathway anymore, uh, where we're so dependent on our natural resources. Um, and again, as I said, there are some front runners, there are front movers, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, they've become, um, you know, the big... Um, leading countries in terms of their production of renewable energy. We have something called the African continental free trade, and that's now become the, the biggest market. It is already the biggest market, but it's become even bigger. Um, so that's the market where all our regional value chains will go through. They're producing all the um, different types of renewable energy um, sources, um, and that's now become more of a, a normal thing. Um, and of course, um, this whole debate about hydrogen and the fuel of the future, it's now in use, and we have been able to find some solutions also um, to some of the problems related to hydrogen. Um, 
what have we, what haven't we got right? What are some of the things that we haven't got right? Well, for starters, um, we have been very, very obsessed and very fixated about science. We've seen science almost as an exceptionalism, that science would solve all our problems. Um, to a large extent, our biophysical references, um, I was sat next to the dean, uh, <laughs> um, our biophysical, uh, um, you know, the biophysical world, that has been our reference point. Um, we point to the biophysics. We don't talk much about the social vulnerability. Um, some things like culture, like society, they've been more or less invisible because we've been so, as I said, so um, fixated on our, on our science, on our IPCC, on our adaptation, mitigation, etc. cetera. Um, and we simply haven't got the tools. We haven't found the tools on how we get some of the very, how do we extract the richness of the indigenous knowledge? How do we attract that? How do we extract that? and make good use of it. So we, we haven't been able to do that. We haven't secured it, we haven't banked it. Um, and to a large extent, the scientific knowledge that has been, you know, uh, some sort of a, a knowledge that sits up there, somewhat hierarchical, looking down at us, um, that has been something that um, hasn't really favored us in terms of where we are. And we haven't been able to embed climate change in our lives, in our societies. Um, that's been a bit of a problem. So some of the blind spots, some of the things that we've missed, well, I just extent, this whole climate thing has been a bit about power, a lot about power, I should say. There's been a lot around power is symmetries. Uh, and this has sort of created a huge blind spot. We haven't seen it. Um, the interest, entrenched interest, multi um, national companies, um, et cetera, et cetera, I wouldn't name them all, but in a sense, we feel that communities have been disempowered. They haven't had um, the roles that they had in the past. So that has been a, a huge problem. And the global has taken over. So some of the things that communities could do nationally within their spaces, they, they, they're not able to do because of the fact that the global is the, the use of has, has completely taken over. And it's a case of the um, the tail wagging the dog. Um, more or less, I think, uh, our, our way of arriving at zero, net zero, um, some of the ethics that would enable net zero, we haven't actually followed some of those ethics. Um, the plurality of voices, the fact that we need to hear voices, we need agency, those things haven't been as manifest as they should have been. Um, and we've reduced those spaces. Um, some of these things that were done in the past where communities have found a way out of managing their own crisis. If you take the example of um, Western Zambia, Kumboka, which literally means getting out of water, communities were able to, with their hierarchical structures, they were able to manage floods. They would get out of the floodplains because they saw that as something's happened. Okay. <laughs> they were able to manage these crises, this environmental crisis, by getting out of the way. And this was orchestrated and done in a way that symbolizes their life, their culture. Um, and, and, and it worked. And what we have now is that those things have not been taken into account in terms of our climate management. And as I said, the global has taken over. And what was known in Western Zambia as the land, I mean, Western Zambia was called by David Livingston as the land of milk and honey. Um, now is uh, one of the poorest um, parts of Zambia because they live on um, handouts and um, I'd say imported goods. Um, ported food, um, but it was a, used to be a very rich plain. So those things that we had rely on, that knowledge that we had, that way of managing our systems, those things are no more. Um, you take the example of uh, the Nganyi people. I mean, this has a happy ending because they have learned ways of how they could use their resources. They've calibrated, the, the, the Nganyi people are basically rainmakers. 
they've been able to understand through a certain set of indicators how to predict what kind of weather patterns they will have. And that prediction has actually helped. They've been able to calibrate um, their knowledge with MET data. So the MET, uh, uh, meteorological uh, people in, in Kenya have been able to come up with their data and that calibration has given them roughly around 95% um, accuracy in terms of agricultural productivity. And that has been really successful. So that knowledge has been preserved and we need more examples like that, how indigenous can interface with um, scientific data. Um, the, the case of the Gambia, again, um, a community that were basically troubled by the intrusion of saline water to the extent that they were not able to practice um, um, the production of rice anymore. And they had to move to salt mining. Um, so this was um, 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 something that really affected their growth, really affected their production systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the, the, the loss in terms of culture is something that we need to take into account because we call it non-economic losses, but to some extent, cultural losses means that they were not able to valueize um, or culture um, to the extent uh, possible. So what's happening? Um, if we want to reimagine a different future, we need to also say that science is not enough. As important as it is, science has to interface with society. Um, it's science for humanity. Um, so how do we ensure that we're localizing solutions? Because in a nutshell, that hasn't been done. That localization of society, where, of solutions, where we would be extracting solutions um, from lived experiences, where people are um, not importing them. Um, and the, the, the governance also has been a bit of a shrinking space. We, we, we have lost those hierarchies, those structures, and everything has been more or less on the, um, the global side. So these are things we need to take into account, that adaptation is a process, these are things we now know, that that culture, that diversity is fundamentally important. We need to have those things, power, justice, these are all aspects that we need to factor into um, our management system. And how we get that right? Well, we need to not think just in terms of binary terms, but we need to see climate change within a holistic picture. It's not a linear thing. Uh, we need to move away from thinking very restrictively because the restrictive one doesn't, um, thinking doesn't allow us to see the wider picture. Um, this whole thing has been very power, power, power driven, power laden, and we need to recognize that that hasn't really helped. So we need to find a justice element in that, how we get justice back. And it's about all the different forms of justice, procedural justice, distributive, restorative, all of these have to be taken into account to get it right. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of this because it would be, it'd be a bit too long, I'd go beyond the time. But we need to think about the different ways of getting justice back into the conversation. Um, some would talk about compensation in terms of restorative justice. Um, some would say, well, how do you then begin to recognize past harms and how do you correct that? How do you then value societies and be a bit more inclusive? Um, so these are things we, 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 we need to get right. We're back again on 2060. Um, and I think some of that has been mentioned by this um, in terms of um, movement of people. So we're now, in 2016, we've seen that there are over 200 million um, environmental refugees. What do we do with that? Um, when people move, they lose their identity, they lose their culture. And that in itself um, is a loss. And we need to recognize that the more we have cultural loss, the more society becomes fragile. So these things happen. So we have to think about how we repair, how we reset, and how we retool. These are all fundamental in terms of where we want to go. But it's about an equilibrium, and it's about culture, power, and justice together. Um, these are fine threads, but they have to be, you know, woven in a way that is really intricate, and we need to find all these different levers um, of bringing this back. I wanted to end with a quote um, by Sheila um, Jessena, who I, I really love in terms of the things that she's written. She says that the gravest challenge for humanity is every bit of scientific 
insight and technological inventiveness about collective disposal. But our uses of science and technology, um, technology properly, our uses of science and technology properly enlightened. It is essential that we take account not only of what science knows, but also how science knows it, um, what it does, uh, what it does not know, and how to compensate for our ignorance. So we need to get away from that absolutism, that certainty about science knows, and try to see how we embed other types of knowledge as well, especially in terms of indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, stay with me, Fatima. Wonderful, thank you so much. I, I completely agree. I think what was so wonderful about hearing your presentation is how you show how complex it still is in 2060. We're still grappling with, you know, what's the place of universal global science in light of all the climate adaptation that's happening right now, the critical, critical need for this local knowledge and traditional knowledge, and how do we also take into account both the biophysical and the social vulnerabilities. So thank you so much, Fatima. Let's turn the lights up. We're gonna hear one question with a microphone and then we'll switch over to Mentimeter. So let's see who has a question and I can see all the way up to the third floor as well. Uh, question or comment for Fatima over here. Wonderful, and we're just gonna bring you the microphone on this floor. Uh, okay, you're gonna shout and then I'll repeat it because I'm not sure, yeah, go ahead. Great. Right, so what's the role of the nation state, which historically in the transition 20s was very much about a Westphalian system. Where do you see it now in 2060? And is it just the global piece and the local or is there something in between yeah. as well? In yes. terms of achieving justice in particular. Yeah. Well, I think um, in, in 2060, because that was my, I was gonna ask you a question about when exactly, uh, what sort of time horizon are we talking about? But yes, in 2060, um, I would say the government, I mean, government have already exercised their role. They've, they, they've done their bit, they've seen um, that, you know, some of the structures in place um, some of the policy instruments in place have gotten them to that goal. Because the, the, the race has been about a temperature goal and getting emissions down. And that would, we wouldn't have been able to achieve that without government, governance and some strong policies. So I would have said that they would have exercised the limit of their powers in 2060s. And so now it would have been about the time to start stepping down from that and basically trying to see, okay, how what is it that we've gotten right in this sort of driven way and race to get it right? Great, thank you. And actually, let me invite uh, Louis Kenji to come up to the stage as well. And now, uh, if you have your mobile devices, we've got the Transition 20s Mentimeter. Simone Pekelsma is helping me at the back here. She's going to turn, have the Mentimeter here. So this is for those of you who would like to actually ask your question, uh, type it out as opposed to asking with a microphone. And um, I'll first see to see if there's another question or comment for Louis and Fatima that's pressing. Otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over to, oh, Martin's got one, and I'll just give Louis a moment to say something about the nation state. I'm sorry? The national government's role. Well, I, I was just thinking about when you asked, when you asked this question. And uh, for a long time, historically, the, the government has been seen, especially in industrialized countries, as, the, the institutional representation of what progress, of how society should move. And it's along these lines that we've designed legislation at a global level, including le legislation for Africa, Latin America, and Asia that do not have the same traditions as European and North American countries. So what that has done is created an inherent conflict in the way the global governance mechanism has brought together the uh, developing and the developed world. What it has also done at a national level is that governments from southern countries 
have not been, have been able to rule, to govern with a very conflicting mode, which is against the traditions, which is against the norms, which is against the values, of, well, not against the values, but it's not designed to inherently hold this. So you could say the governance mechanism in itself was perpetuating the problem. Now in 2060, what has happened is a strengthened bottom-up perspective, a re-evaluation of the values that predetermine what, how we design policies. So our policies, what you invest in, tells what values you have. What policies you put out tells what values you have. And I think all of this have been recalibrated to, to reflect local perspectives, local skill sets, but also local needs and desires. Great, thanks Louise. Over here to Martin, Martin Heyer. Oh. How did you see the IPCC evolve <laughs> since the roaring 20s? Good luck. <laughs> In 2060, yeah, so I have to keep asking. Um, well, I think the IPCC had a very big role, a very mm -hmm. strong role in sort of that destination point, that arrival of, you know, low emissions, some of the things that we mentioned or that I mentioned um, related to that carbon intensity, their narratives have really helped government, has really, government has taken a leave out of their book, basically. So I would say that um, to a large extent, um, IPCC has directed our, um, uh, you know, has, has shaped our direction of travel. Um, but again, that to me is a representative of that absolutist science. Mm -hmm. the science that hasn't taken other forms of science along the way. And I think what I would like to see sort of going back to reimagine future is understanding that, you know, there are other caveats to that science, you know, that are very much embedded in values and in society. And because we haven't taken them along with us, you know, we've gotten to some kind of, um, um, how should I put it, artificial arrival of... Um, you know, emissions reductions, but other things haven't helped, you know. Other things, we, we've blind spotted on other things, basically. Fatima, do you want to speak a bit about the regional bodies that have emerged now as a kind of counterbalance that? What is, yeah. what is there, what's unique about them now, the regional bodies on climate change? Yeah, because um, to a large extent, these regional bodies were in retreat. Um, we, are the, we were at a stage where, you know, as Louis men mentioned, everything revolved around the conference of parties, the global body bodies um, that, are, that, as I mentioned, somewhat usurped the regional, usurped the national, usurped the local. Um, so these regional bodies have now become more powerful because they're able to design their own policies based on their contextual experiences. Um, when you talk about energy poverty in parts of Africa, they're not experienced globally, they experience regionally. And countries that are within a regional community, economic community, can actually share policies. You know, they can decide on, you know, what kind of trade barriers or what kind of tariffs, et cetera, et cetera, they can apply. So regional bodies have more of a bigger role because they've been able to evaluate their policies based on their context. Yeah, and I really like that the loss and damage is now being decided at that level, which is great. Simone, would you like to bring us a, a, a Mentimeter question for our keynotes? On. Yes, you're, you're now live. Am I on? Yes, thanks, great. Simone. Yes, the um, Mentimeter is exploding, actually. Fantastic. Um, but the most pressing <laughs> question seems to be, what happened to capitalism? Oh, capitalism. <laughs> Lewis, let's start with you. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to start from, before I get to capitalism, what happened to consumerism? And uh, I said, a summary of this is, we realize that materialism doesn't answer all the questions, or doesn't satisfy all our needs. But for a long time, over decades, there was a very strong competition between you know, uh, the more capitalist ingrained aspects of society and those that were having a, a more value-driven orientation. This is two examples of how this would play out typically. One is the technology industry, which has mapped out exactly, primarily because it, has a lot of, it had a lot of data in the 2030s and before. It could map out trajectories of where the future could lead, and it could really 
infiltrate governance mechanisms and so on with this vision of the future. The other one was the fossil fuel-based energy provisioning that, that we were heavily dependent on, partly because it was very rich, partly because it informed most of our needs, our goods, and our services. And they could not see a world in which we will not need fossil fuel anymore. But I would remind those that have also been reading history books that it took about 13 years for horses to disappear from the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. And those that did not plan for the disappearing of horses on the streets of New York were the losers uh, when that eventually happened and happened so fast. It is the same thing that happened to the automobile industry. We could not imagine a world in which private car use was not elemental to the design of our cities, to transportation system. But once it started cascading, and the fossil fuel industry cascading with it, things radically changed. And we noticed that the absence of imagination we had had, because we were captured by this technology, and fossil fuel industries suddenly gave way when this cascade started and things started collapsing. That's, that is why alternatives grew. Dr. Denton, yeah. what happened to capitalism since the transition 20s? I think it died. <laughs> I, think, I think it was caged for a while, and um, I think it's, you know, it withered, it withered away, um, because we, we realized just how absorbed, I mean, for a long time, we didn't know how to replace cap capitalism. It's been even more successful than itself, if I can put it that way. And so we found a way, and it, it was a bit of a race, because some regions of the world could not get out of it as fast. So it was not an overnight death, but I think it slowly died. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And let's just see if there's someone with a hand up. I'm looking, I'm looking. Hand up, hand up. Here, here's one. Okay, so we're going to come here, and then we'll come back to the Mentimeter. Um, over here is a question. And also in the third row, I'm looking to make sure that I haven't missed anybody up there. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very enlightening and inspiring. And uh, I think both of you spoke of uh, uh, justice and um, cheating or lying and this kind of aspect that is still very present uh, in humanity and in science too. Um, how can humans understand that we cannot cheat nature? And I think in Africa you can learn that a lot, right? Because if we can, nature is so strong that you cannot really fight it and you have to follow it. Thank you. Great, Dr. Denton. <laughs> he looks to me. <laughs> do we have we learned that we cannot cheat nature? Um, have we learned? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. Uh, short answer. Um, yeah, I mean, to a large extent, we've we've gone back to some of our nature-based solutions. Um, we've realised. I mean, take Africa as a, an example that has been very very reliant on its land-based systems um, and hold, you know, economies that were reliant on agriculture, their agricultural potential decimated because we had this thing called extractives and we need to kind of mine and explore and mine and explore and which only served a very small minority, an enclave economy and monies did not trickle down. Um, and so we, we, we have seen actually, as I said several times, that this is a continent to emulate actually. I, I, I really believe that because the, it's a continent that's rich in all these resources. Um, it's a continent that would lead the transition that is leading to transition. That's why I started my first slide with countries like Zimbabwe and Ethiopia that have now found their feet and leading transition. So yes, to a large extent, we've gone back to getting it right um, because nature plays catch up um, sooner or later and, and that has happened. But we've seen the light. I, I think uh, what we cannot estimate is what happened in Europe in the late 20s and uh, 30s when a lot of the forecasting or the modeling exercises said how horrible things would happen in Bangladesh or in Africa or in Latin America, in faraway places that we only see on TV or we only saw on TV. And suddenly in the 20s, we're seeing floods in Germany. We're seeing large portions of land getting unproductive in Europe. And all of this sort of uh, feedback loops that we had not anticipated were really beginning to get very overwhel overwhelming. And of course, when it touched the most powerful, a quick realization that 
you know, the, the, the models we were depending upon to design our solutions were not really serving the truth because things started happening faster than we anticipated in places which we had not expected and in ways that we had not planned for. Thank you. Simone. Yes, I've got many more questions, 87 to be precise. <laughs> this is very valuable, so we'll hold on to those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so this is a very fundamental question, perhaps on the nature of human beings. Um, how did you get people to give up power and money? Great. Oof. That's, yeah. a, that's a big question. Good luck. Who would like to start? <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> well, I'm not rich, so I don't know. And, and, uh, but we, we also have to remember that now in 2060, we have a lot more equitable opportunities than we had in 2030 and 2040s. This is primarily because the models that the, 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 the policies that we now have in place and the practices that we now have in place are less prioritized in terms of the economy, but in terms of how people feel well. And a lot of it was not just asking people to give up. It was, a lot of it was mandated. So for example, the policy that came in place that the top 10% of the country cannot own more than 40% of national income really help in terms of distribution of opportunities and access. The second one is that we're not only looking at reducing emissions, we're also looking at creating a social floor for people to not fall under. Because a lot of the policies that we're putting in place in the 20s and the 30s to address energy, for example, caused energy poverty for certain people and they moved into the poverty zone. But once we established that social floor, the opportunities within which we negotiated our needs between that so, uh, environmental ceiling and a social floor made things a lot more equitable. So it was not just an issue of voluntarily giving up, it was an issue of demanding this by law and some bloodshed. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, give I said the, it. I'll give the final word, word to, uh, to Dr. Fatima Denton. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better than what Louis said. I think. Um, a combination of strong policies, measures that were in place. And I think there was a sense of lowering, I mean, leveling the playing field. So it wasn't a sense of, you know, you, this person have more than that person or that society would have, you know. So that was leveled to the sense that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't felt like, you know, one had to have more than the other. So that sense of competition that also comes with capitalism. Um, where you need to have more and it's accumulation and it's how much can you get and you know those things we're taking out of the equation. So I think that sort of um, helped to level the playing field but also take away the tension um, from you know our, our sense of being so fixated with power and, and so hungry for power. Yeah. Great. Well please join me in thanking Dr. Louis Akenji and Dr. Fatima Denton. <laughs> Wonderful. So how many of us are from Utrecht University or are somewhat affiliated with the university? Let's take a look. You can look around you, okay? And then put your hands down. How many of you are partners, coming here from our partners, our community members, different community groups? Yeah, wonderful. There's a few of you as well. Well, welcome. If, if you come from the university, come from community partners, you're most welcome. Each of you on your tag has the key aspect that you felt made a difference when you reached 2060. So I encourage you to find someone you don't know at the conference and share with them what you feel is a key aspect of the 2060, the transition from the transition 20s to 2060 that made the difference. We're now gonna take a break. Uh, down the stairs to the left are the bathrooms. There's gonna be coffee and tea. When we come back at 11.15 in exactly half an hour, Ninka Laframon, Tsitsu Praxma, Please come join us at 11.15. Enjoy your break.
He's a heavy wetter from the Cumberland Gap. A Johnson City, Tennessee. And I gotta get a move on fit for the sun. And I hear my baby calling my name, and I know that she's the only one. And if I die in Raleigh, at least I will die free.
zo. Ja, dat is juist ook wel. Ja, nee, en dan zal je vast iets moeten doen. Ja, oké. Okay. Als je dit doet, dan doet hij het wel. Ja. Dus dat moest hij niet. Misschien zou ik nog eventjes... Ja, uh, misschien alleen Ja, je moet hem eigenlijk op je kin zetten. Kijk, en dan, dan gebeurt er ook, ook dit. Ja, haha, hi, hi. Het zijn niet de mooiste microfoons, maar ze doen het wel. Ja, ja. Haha. Ja, ha. Hi, 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 hi. Ja, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ja. It's actually nice that there's not all
Hey, hey, hey. Hey, yeah. Ha-ha. Hey, hey. Yeah. Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. Yeah. Ha-ha-ha. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey. Hey, 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 yeah. Hey, 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 yeah, 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 ha, ha. Hey, 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 yeah, ha, ha. Hey, hey, yeah, ha, yeah, ha, ha, yeah, ha, 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 yeah, yeah, ha, yeah, yeah, ha, yeah, ha, ha, yeah.
Welcome back. This song is about a woman nobody listened to. Please don't go. Remember Cassandra? Daughter of Priam, King of Troy, back in the old Greek days. Apollo, one of the gods in town, asked her to share his bed. She accepted the offer, but instead of laying down her hat, she asked him for the gift of prophecy in return. Apollo fixed it right away and came to collect what he had earned. But then she turned him down and walked away. Filled with rage, he summoned her, asking for just one last kiss. Cassandra offered him her lips in order not to make it worse. But when his burning lips touched her, he turned his gift into a curse by spitting in her mouth. He ensured that she would not be heard, that her predictions would be mocked, that no one would believe her words. And so it happened that Cassandra warned time and time again of future ill, the fall of Troy, but all her efforts were in vain, though her predictions were all true. She could not prevent the Trojan horse from riding in, killing her dad and all his men who had laughed at her and called her names. Prophet of doom, prophet of doom, declared insane, declared change Cassandra long before the others do. How come we laugh away your words and simply turn our backs on you? Since the wind of change Cassandra long before the others do. on you, our backs on you, our backs on you, Cassandra, our backs on you, our backs on you, our backs on you, our backs on you. If you had kept your promise, would we have listened? If you had kept your promise, Cassandra. Would we ever listen to you if you had kept your promise? Remember Cassandra. Ik weet niet hoe het verder gaat. Hoeveel liedjes nog? Hoeveel akkoorden? Hoeveel rake noten? Hoeveel missers? Hoeveel meer woorden? Hoeveel tranen van ontroering? Hoeveel films in 4K? Hoeveel schitterende, schokkende beelden nog? Hoeveel vuisten op tafel? 
Hoeveel statements? Hoeveel vragen? Hoeveel dagen nog te gaan? Hoeveel begrip? Begrotingen? Vergaderingen? Hoeveel draagvlak? Hoeveel draagvlak voor de aarde? Hoeveel zorgvuldig vergaarde feiten? Getoetst? En nog eens getoetst? En nog eens door een onafhankelijke commissie getoetst, uiterst zorgvuldig weggepoetst. Ik weet niet hoe het verder gaat. Zit vast. Of we moeten wachten tot er iemand opstaat die zegt, oké okay, jongens. Tot hier. Zo kunnen we niet verder. Nu slaan we de handen in één. Hoeveel gelijk nog te behalen? Hoeveel blijk van inzicht? Hoeveel licht nog op de zaak? Hoeveel goede intenties? Hoeveel wens denk je nog? Hoeveel mens? Ik weet niet hoe het verder gaat. Of we moeten rennen, moeten schuilen, moeten... Strijden of berusten, moeten lachen, moeten huilen, moeten wennen. Ik weet niet hoe het verder gaat. Of het donker wordt of licht. Of er seizoenen zullen zijn. Of de nacht een dag duurt of een uur. Of er muren zullen vallen tussen dit en dat en wel en niet of onderscheid bestaat. Of we een draad op kunnen pakken. Of er geuren over zijn om herinneringen terug te vinden. Glinsteringen die verraden waar de liefde woont. Hoeveel liefde. Hoeveel tederheid. Hoeveel oprecht verlangen naar een regelrechte ramp met verwoestende gevolgen, naar een breekijzer voor niet te breken onmacht, onverwoestbare patronen waar onmogelijk uit te komen, hoeveel dromen, hoeveel bomen aan te planten, hoeveel krantenkoppen nog, hoeveel drammers, hoeveel apocalyptisch gezwam nog weg te lachen, hoeveel nog te lachen, hoeveel nog te pikken. Hoeveel gif nog te slikken, hoeveel murf gepolderd, uitgeluld, geduld, hoeveel geduld, hoeveel schuld nog door te schuiven, hoeveel weg te wuiven, hoeveel mitsen, hoeveel maren, hoeveel waarheid nog. Hoeveel overdonderende schoonheid, hoeveel overweldigend geluk, hoeveel stuk te maken nog, hoeveel gif, of wat ik dacht zeg. Ik zou zo graag opnieuw verliefd worden op ons. Zo graag. Everything will be all right. As a mother, that is what I want to say to my children. But how to say that and be honest at the same time? Alles wat ik zeggen kan, is dat leefde net stikken kan. All I can say is that love can't be broken. Alles wat 
ik zit ik nu. Is dat leven net steken kind? En uit alles liet ze leven, jongetje. Alles als wat er is. En alles was to best. Alleen te maken is. En alles. Alles. Om. in de splinter alles 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 komt door en alles wat ik zie is ik weet is dat leven net steken kind en dat al Sleets lief jongetje, alles als wat er is, en alles was to best van lief te maken is, en alles, alles komt. Minka Laferman and Sietse Prasma, thank you. And for those of you who uh, are, are English speaking rather than Dutch speaking, some of the things that Minka was saying, I don't know how to go further. How many songs, accords, words, tears of concern, films, beautiful images, statements, questions, facts, reports with independent committees. Should we run, test, laugh, adapt? Not sure. Is it dark or light, the seasons, the night? How much should we push, blame, push toxins, beauty? Do we pick up the thread, the memories, what love is? I so dearly want to fall in love again with us. So dearly. And now we have a panel looking back to the transition 20s. So I'd like to invite my, the panelists to come up to the stage um, and I'll introduce you. We're going to be using Mentimeter, so maybe we'll also put that on the screen as well, the Mentimeter, um, and we'll actually have a chance to speak uh, with the panelists before we transition. There's the code for the Mentimeter. Welcome. So we have Harriet, Elena, and Beatrice, and they're going to actually talk with us about how we got to April 4, 2060. What were some of the incredible socio-ecological transformations that took place? And we'll actually use the Mentimeter and the uh, microphones in the audience to take your questions afterwards. Let me introduce all three of them, and then we'll hear from them each in turn. Professor Dr. Harriet Buckley, 
holds joint appointments as a professor in the Department of Geography at Durham University in the United Kingdom and at the Copernicus Institute for Sustainable, of Sustainable Development here at Utrecht University. And her research focuses on environmental governance and the politics of climate change, energy, and sustainable cities. And more recently, uh, in 2057, she was the convener of the, um, the task force, it's a United Nations task force on nature for all. So that's Professor Dr. Harry Buckley. Dr. Eileen Hutter is an assistant professor at Utrecht University in Chemistry and at the Debbie Institute for Nanomaterial Science. And at her very ancient age now, I'd like to be so thrilled that she's here. She's just won a lifetime achievement Achievement Award in Artificial Intelligence and Solar Energy. So, you know, thank you so much for coming uh, to speak with us about that over your long journey of your career. And Dr. Beatrice, Beatrice de Graaf, she's a distinguished professor at Utrecht Department of History and Art History. She has a specialty in security, counterterrorism, and international relations. And um, she's also since 2053 the International Criminal Court of Justice advisor, advisor on space crimes. So we're really happy to have her here to speak with us about that. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just take five minutes to help us think about the pathway that we've taken, the pathway from the 20, transition 20s to today. I'll start with you, over to you, Harriet. I think it's coming, go ahead, try again. Not quite yet, and it's coming. Exactly, <laughs> no. now you're on. Okay, okay. we're good, thanks. I saw that happen. All right, so thank you very much for inviting me to share the stage with you today, and it's a pleasure to reflect on how it is that we've got to a position now in society where not only do we value nature, but we work with and alongside it to improve our resilience to climate change and enhance people's well-being. Now, it's been a long journey, and I'm only going to be able to share a few of the turning points along the way. Um, but as you know, it started here, right here in the Netherlands, and, and indeed, I think Utrecht was part of, the, part of this uh, movement. A turning point came when it was discovered that uh, wild irises that were growing along some parts of the Dutch rivers were doing really, really well, given the nitrogen situation. <laughs> and so what happened was that uh, we, there was a purposeful program to rewild the rivers, and, night, and uh, these wild irises became so valuable, along with the other kinds of uh, wildlife that was planted in the rivers, that they became known as the purple gold. And farmers just gave up everything else and just concentrated on irises, flowers. It went into the Dutch horticultural industry, of course, but also massive discoveries in the Dutch biomedicine industry. And so it became like a new set of pharmaceuticals, and farmers had never really known it so good. So with the well-being of the farmer community established and these nature-based solutions that were being used on land and in rivers at the same time, of course, then we saw the Dutch water industry profiting hugely from rolling this out, this approach to nature-based solutions globally. So we had, you know, the Dutch were really then again a center of civilization for the world during the 20s. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting there. I've only got five minutes. Um, so, as land and water started to be used for different reasons, then we had space to think about rewilding. Of course, the rewilding movement had started before, but more and more land got set aside for protected areas, and we saw increasing areas being used for all sorts of different kinds of nature protection. Um, this was sponsored by the companies like Shell, like IKEA, who were keen, of course, to reach their net zero targets. On the one hand, and the banking industry, recovering from the collapse of 2023, 24, you all remember that, <laughs> um, were able to kind of develop new financial products, debt for nature swaps, resilience bonds, and so on, which helped to develop nature-based solutions further. Now, these forms of managed transition that we saw in the 20s and into the early 30s were all very well, but we know that nature has a habit of doing its own thing. So as the use of nature-based solutions grew through the, 19, the 2030s, it became clear that some more significant transformations were underway. It was a bit of a shame when not one but three of Scarlet Hood's grandmothers were attacked by wolves in the suburbs of Utrecht. <laughs> but at least this drew attention to the lack of more edible nature across urban areas. And it showed, the research at the time showed that many cities, I mean, it's hard to believe now, but many cities had these nature deserts. People have talked about food deserts before, but we hadn't really thought about nature deserts in this way. 
with growing levels of heat and water stress and the kinds of civil unrest that this was creating, then you know, this became a real challenge. And if, you know, it seems that the wolves are right, that you know, pretty much there wasn't anything else worth eating but grandmothers in the suburbs. So the immediate solution was to encourage schools and communities to get like little herds of miniature goats. And that allowed you to rewild like meadows and parks and everything. And you had all these miniature goats grazing around and they were you know, really nice snacks. But obviously as the climate change <laughs> zones changed, um, the wolves just moved up further north to Denmark where the collapse of the pork industry had really created a lot of wild pigs. So we were pretty much safe by then. But this incident led to a, a much broader refraction. Nature was thriving, but society was not. The solutions proposed in the 20s and 30s to protect nature from people had led to a severing of society's relationship with its most fundamental need, nature. So with the 2040 targets for nature restoration and protection set by the UN goals achieved, largely due to the likes of Shal and Ikea, um, a more radical solution was needed to ensure that people could benefit. So this is when the great unlocking began. With a memory of the wolf raids of the 30s to the 4, Utrecht City led the way. On July the 14th, 2049, a mere 260 years after the storming of the Bastille in Paris, Utrecht threw open the doors of its botanic gardens and tore down the walls. <laughs> and invited communities living in nature deserts to extract the nature they needed for their own parks, playgrounds, streets and gardens to create a new form of urban nature that could be accessed by all. Other botanic gardens across the world quickly followed suit. Uh, what was the point of keeping all the nature that we needed behind those walls? And besides, genetic 3D printing and seed banks in every country now meant that rare species and even those that have gone extinct, like the English rose, of course, that had withered during the heat waves of the 30s, could easily be re replicated in a matter of minutes. Now, to be fair, printing a black rhino did take a bit more time, but that was really because of the security measures you had to put in place on the other side. Mm -hmm. So with the great unlocking, communities have chosen the kinds of nature that they want. It's not uncommon these days to see what we used to call native European plants alongside those that originate from Australia and Latin America. New climates and new times have called for a new kind of nature. We kept nature behind doors in a small number of botanic gardens around the world and in the protected areas that we'd established. We'd have never found out how important coral reefs have become in protecting the Dutch coast or enabled so many people across the world to grow their own food and live within kind of communities with the kinds of nature that they want. Making the world sustainable in 2060s meant following a very old truth. If you love something, you have to set it free. Elena. Hey, yeah, sorry, that was well over time. But. You cannot imagine how worried I used to be as a child. I grew up in The Hague, very close to the sea. We were seeing these global temperatures rising each year, and I was really afraid that The Hague would end up in the sea. What was also worrying me is that we, Western countries, were doing business as usual. Okay, there were some efforts, by, mainly by individuals, to move towards more sustainable energy sources, like solar panels. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture, but in the 20s, we used to have these big, bulky modules on our rooftops. Some people did it because they felt it was ugly. But still, I would be running my dishwasher at night when I was generating no electricity. It was actually only after the big wildfires in Europe and the USA at the late 2020s that things really started to move. So then in 2030, a global tax on CO2 emission was introduced, and then the money that was earned was invested in science and technology. So for me, as a young scientist back then, those were really the days. I started to collaborate with social scientists, with architects, and through these collaborations, we started to realize that we had to make our technologies more appealing, more attractive. And this is when we uh, developed like flexible solar cells that could be integrated into rooftop tiles, walls of outdoor buildings, and windows. And we even developed the solar cells that now convert the energy from indoor light to electricity that we all place on our indoor walls. A major problem, however, at that time was the storage of, uh, smart of, the storage of electricity. And this is when we started to collaborate with computers. So we started by using the enormous battery capacity of electric vehicles, and by making sure that these electric vehicles were always connected to the grid, the renewable energy could temporarily be stored between production and use. 
It was also the collaboration with computers that helped us to match our energy consumption more with our production. And this is why our, your computer in your house now runs your dishwasher in the afternoon <laughs> instead of the night. Another uh, major problem, of course, in 2045 was the CO2 that we had already emitted in the air. And then we started to take inspiration from nature because actually Mother Nature already invented three billion years ago how to convert CO2 into useful forms of energy using light. So this is known as photosynthesis in plants. So what we then did, again, collaborating with computers with artificial intelligence, we started to predict what kind of materials could do the same job. So we started making human-made materials that now convert the CO2 from the air into fuels and building blocks for, for instance, plastics. Um, we even figured out how to use these materials to clean our indoor air environment. So in 2055, Tivoli covered its entire ceilings with a material that uses the energy from indoor light to break down all the virus particles in here. Imagine if you would have been here in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been full of aerosols in here. <laughs> so, altogether, the smart use of the enormous energy from sunlight and from indoor light to generate electricity, to perform chemical reactions, to convert the CO2 from the air into useful forms of energy and building blocks had at least saved The Hague from ending up below the sea. Thank you. What do we see in the future? Darkness returned to the countryside and to the urbanized landscapes of the global west. Noises that were forgotten echoed through the metropoles. The stained grayish white dew that had always been the inner city night sky cleared away. Smells, animal buzzing, humming, deep sensations, solid shades of black draped themselves across human civilization again. On the 1st of January 2028, when in a collective pre-dawn effort, power was cut to most of the big metropoles across the globe, panic broke out. Everywhere, observatories received phone calls from spooked residents panicking about the strange sky. What they were seeing were the stars. They came back, piggybacking on a series of tectonic shocks and development triggered by the hell year of 2027. The revolution of October 2007, 2027 was a global one, a devastated civil political order as our parents knew it. In contrast to the peaceful revolutions of 1989, the 2027 one inserted itself in a series of big ruptures and violent clashes of 1789, 1848 and 1917 both in terms of violence, elite removal, and new constitutional orders. That year, droughts had disrupted food supplies, not just in the US, but also in greater Ukraine and in Europe. Storms, wildfires, hellish winter led to mass mobilization. The White House declared war on climate change and started experiments with climate-altering technologies. That triggered a Star Wars battle between the United States and China, illuminating the skies, the stratosphere, the cosmos, with giant orbiting lasers, later toting satellites to shoot the sky and win supremacy over changing the weather in their part of the world. But what really triggered the revolution was the insect apocalypse. <laughs> that made itself felt in the disappearance of trillions of insects, the demise of millions of animals within one month. Plants and animals depend on the Earth's daily cycle of light and dark to govern life-sustaining behaviors such as reproduction, nourishment, sleep and protection from predators. When the combination of droughts, wildfires and especially the laser satellites increased the level of artificial light, this tipped the scale of the light and dark cycle that no one had expected. The 
insect apocalypse broke the balance. Insect pollinate crops and wild plants, they are the basis of our food chains. With the bugs gone, agriculture, the entire ecosystem collapsed. And that triggered a revolution. In the Netherlands, the merger party of the Green Union teamed up with the Farmers' Front. In other countries, the populists joined the animal parties and they followed the textbook of the classic historical revolutions of yore. No transition, but a complete overthrow of the existing political regime, the universities, the big tech giants, the people took over. It was classic Tilly Huntington class interest-based revolt because what all the elites had ignored was the ecological balance. Thus, on the 1st of January 20, 2008, the new revolutionary government ushered in a new era of darkness, ending the light pollution, restoring biodiversity and the global ecosystems of day and night. They took back the night and our screens. Right in line with one of our big bio-prophets, Johan Eckloff, had already predicted the darkness manifesto 2020. Please look it up. The night revolution was a fact. When the news was announced on the radio, radio was back again, they did so while citing old Eckler. The experience of looking up at the night sky is the experience of the sublime, to wonder and worship and let our hearts be filled with wonder again. And across those vast skies, the surviving people were gazing up, pointing out the stars to their children again, and listening to the humming of the remaining winter gnats. Thank you so much. What a vision of all the different transitions that took place since 2060, the great unlocking of nature and nature-based solutions. Uh, Elena bringing our imaginations towards the kind of energy revolutions and how they beautified our environments, the darkness, the revolutions, the insect apocalypse. So now it's over to you. We have some time for, actually we can bring the house lights up again to see if there's any microphone questions, and also Simone is going to help us with uh, the Mentimeter again. So let's see if there's somebody also on the third row up there, if there's someone up there who would like to ask a question here on the second row. Let's see if there's somebody up there. If there's a, a question or a comment that I'd like to see here and help it down here. All right, I'm coming back up to this because now you've thought of something. You've got a comment. Yes, here, over here. So what do you think is a question from this transition 20s and the 2060 that we're in today? Go ahead. I'm Can you hear me? Yes. I'm delighted that humans' unquenchable thirst for power at night has led to the sublimity of darkness. Will we continue to um, need energy to power our lives um, in the year 2070 as well. Great, thank you. I think this is to you, Beatrice, in your vision of the next 10 years. While being an expert on space crime in 2060s, uh, I do think that we still will need some sort of energy, but um, unfortunately, that really is not my kind of um, speciality to comment upon. Uh, and I will be very much closely controlled and monitored by universities watch over the integrity of our research. So my integrity of research is on security and crime, not on energy. Great. Yeah. So Elena, because you're also focused on energy, do you want, I'm going to pass it over to you. Yes. Um, so of course, I think we all need energy to be alive, right? We need energy in our bodies to be able to move and speak and do whatever we want. So of course, we need uh, energy in the form of food, uh, I think we still, like in 2023, we want to be together sometimes, so we need to travel somewhere. I mean, we can do that in the form of energy of walking somewhere, but 
if we have to work, walk or go far away, we may still want to use some form of energy like to transport ourselves. So of course, I think the amount of energy that each person in the Netherlands was using in 2023 was a bit ridiculous, but we still use some sort of energy today. Yes. Great, thanks. Let's go to Simone, uh, Mentimeter questions, uh, go ahead. Yes, we've got many again. Uh, very practical question to all three. Um, imagine you could travel in time and reach a 2023 audience of more than 300 privileged people. Yes, imagine that. Imagine that. Um, they all mm -hmm. want to make an impact. What task do you give them that they can carry out immediately? Great. Over to you, Harriet. What task for a 2023 audience? Imagine going back 37 years. Um, what, would you, what would you task them? I, I would uh, ask them to look at where their pensions are invested. <laughs> I would ask them not to think about doing something like turning off their lights, because I think that's pointless. Um, I think I would ask them to make sure that they only do anything in a collective. Um, and I think that where your finance is going, and I would also ask them to make sure that the university's finance is invested sensibly too. Great. Go ahead, Beatrice. Yes, I would urge people to take Johan Eklov seriously the modern Cassandra of our day because his uh, night manifesto is really out there since two years and no one has paid much attention to it. Irina. Yeah, so I, I agree also with the investments and I think we want to make sure that other countries do not make the same stupid mistakes that we did. So I would be in favor of investing in countries with growing economies uh, to make sure that they can go to a sustainable economy right away. Great. All right, I'm looking again if there's microphone, hands, Hands up here, up here. Let's see. And then what about on the third floor? I'm definitely going to look for one question from the top floor. So get ready. There, I see you. Oh, can we bring the microphone over to this person here? Um, let's see where the microphone is. As we're getting it to you, we're going to. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, you can ask a question, yeah. Harriet. I'm, I'm really curious about what happens to restaurants and discos. Are we, are we allowed out at night or do, does this now mean that we only have to work between like 9 and 12 and then we go to restaurants and discos like in the afternoon? I right. think and uh, discos of course is a bit of a retro term, I'm sure that's <laughs> probably called what it, what a disco? <laughs> Yeah, what is a disco? What is that funny thing? Yeah, what happens? Where do we go dancing? I think that taking the, the night and day cycle more seriously means that there will be strict regulations on when to eat and when to go to sleep and uh, that there will be more hybrid forms of working and dining at the same oh, well, place. This, this sounds pretty boring though. <laughs> it is, it is. At the same time, at the same time, uh, it cannot be helped. It can't be helped. So, so I, I, I'm not, I mean, are there not like sort of black markets then? Of course. Emerging of course. Of like <laughs> no, it's not black markets, it's light, it's, it's light, light, light markets. Light markets. <laughs> Well, now that we see the stars we again, we can dance so this the is, stars, yeah, right? Well, is this a bit like the rave culture of the 1990s uh, coming back again? Then? Sorry, really showing my age no, now. No, but the, the darkness is a luxury. Darkness it's considered a luxury. Oh, so okay. there are still places in the world uh, in the 2060s where the darkness has not got hold. Okay. And those places are the deserts of the world. Yeah, like Dubai. So yeah. Rather, rather uh, be bored and live in the, the desert. Yeah, yeah. Dubai now. yeah. Great. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, you're Can on. you hear me? Yes. Ah, no. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Ivo and I had a question concerning futuring because what we see here, we have a lot of visions for 2060 and I think a lot of us share the views, the visions, and essentially ideal scenario. And just imagining we're in 2060, how would we go about when people just have a way different worldview than we do now? and that actually want to build back the world that we have now. How will we go about such movements? Imagine yourself living in 2060 and they want to go back to the extractive world, they want to get back to the capitalist neoliberal system that we have. How would you go about this? Right. To so, all of you. Yeah, great. Who would like to respond to that? If you, do we see movements of kind of wanting to go back to the t transition 20s? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe I don't quite share the same view as other people on the stage this morning or, or here now, but I don't think that any of those things go away. Uh, I think we live with them uneasily and we have other kind, you know, we're always going to live in a multiple world views. They're always going to be contested and they're going to exist. So those parts of society maybe become less common 
uh, just in maybe in the same way that you have uh, more commonly now equality, gender equality, but you also still have societies where you don't have gender equality. Um, so maybe we, we will have a kind of multiple and contesting side. So, yeah, I think there will be lots of divisions and borders and, yeah, maybe bloodshed between you, coming back to Lewis's point earlier. Um, but, uh, yeah, those movements will be there and we will have to work out how to politically manage and get along and, and move alongside with them while the majority world is in the kind of approaches that we're talking about. Beatrice. Yes, what, what you're practically describing is a world that has undergone a transition. What I tried to point to, but that's very difficult to predict for the future, is not a world of transition, that's world, a world that went through a revolution. And that's something completely different, because during a revolution, remember the French Revolution, there was a paradigm in world history. It was unequaled. The revolution of 1917, the Communist Revolution, was in the Soviet Union, unparalleled. It, brought, it ushered in a complete new world, and it broke down not just the elites, it killed so many people. There was so much violence as well. Uh, and it may happen like that as well. If there's enough class-based, interest-based revolt, it may happen. I cannot predict that, so that's really my struggle as an historian. I look back, I don't look forward, and I know that Johan Schott, he works on deep transitions, but there's practically only one element, the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, that we can hark back to. That's not enough for sustainable experiments. But I would say that, that there's a high probability that the world will follow the revolutionary trajectory rather than the transitional directory. That can just be flipped and triggered by something completely stupid. So what Beatrice is saying is basically what you're experiencing on stage is a multiverse of futuring of what we understand 2060 to be. Uh, let's go to one more um, uh, question from the, from the Mentimeter. Yeah, I have a question that ties in with uh, Beatrice's comment just now. Um, how do we decide what violence, because it is going to be violent, uh, what is justified and what is harmful? Well, a revolution puts that on its head. During the French Revolution, the guillotine was introduced as the perfect, sane, healthy, justified way. That was the commission of public sanity that did away, public health, if you like, that did away with the people that spoiled the new order. So exactly your question will be toppled in a revolution and things will be put on their heads, like in the communist revolution as well. So the class system was completely re revolted and put on its head again. So what does seem completely justified and, um, and, and, and legitimized for us now may be considered already violent or the violence may be be, be become completely acceptable again and the threshold of violence will be lowered. I mean, already in the rhetorics, we can witness something happening like that. There's more demonization, more dehumanization of people uh, of the various extremes of the political spectra uh, that we can witness now based on the socials. Uh, that's just rhetorics. It's not yet uh, out there on the streets, but who knows uh, how that will uh, follow this trajectory. So one final reflection from each of you, just something that is something you think is key to keep in mind about this transition we've been through. Elena, do you want to start? Revolution. Revolution from Beatrice. <laughs> Elena? Policy. Policy? How about you, Harriet? Well, I think we actually need to get rid of the way in which we think about the world at the moment. I mean, um, I haven't had a question from any of the conservationists in the room asking me whether I don't actually believe that some kinds of nature are better than others, for example, um, which I'm imagining somebody might ask me over lunch. Uh, but yeah, we, we have very set categories, of what we think is good and what we think is bad. And I think those are the categories which will need to change if we're going to be moving forwards. And uh, those will be, things that are currently we think are good, like we think quiet is good, we think you know, muesli is nice or granola or whatever it is, but I d we live in a particular kind of bubble, right? We've got particular sets of values, but they're not all shared. And we're going to need to loosen the values about what we think a good society is to make room for multiple forms of good society to emerge. And some of them may be revolutionary, some of them may not be. Join me in thanking Harriet, Elena, and Beatrice. Thank you so much. Safe up, safe up. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, do, do you guys feel that? Oh, wait, are we, I feel like we're in a time machine. I think so. Wait, are, oh my God, are we moving back to 2050? And back to 2040? And back to 2030? And 
back to 2020? Oh my gosh, this is... Oh, oh, oh. Wow, that was a, quite a journey. I hope you're all okay. Welcome to the Pathways to Sustainability Conference 2023. Thank you for joining us on that time machine and uh, ride and journey. And it's my pleasure to introduce the curator of this morning's uh, plenary sessions, Professor Dr. Martin Heyer, who is also the scientific director of the Pathways to Sustainability theme, a distinguished professor in urban futures and the head of the Urban Futures Studio. I'd like to welcome you up here, Martin, and I'll also bring up Ninka Lavramon and Sitze. Uh, Breaksmuff, if you could come forward. Martin, we just spent some time seeing the future. That was the theme, starting from 2060. Could you talk to us a little bit about the intention of this 2060 experiment? Um, it's pretty obvious that if we keep continuing doing the things the way we did, we get what we got. So we need to transform and not only call for others to transform, but start with our own very practices. And the one practice that we have most control over is our conference. That's the, the unit of academic thinking. That is what we do. That's our privilege, our peg. We travel intercontinental under the pretense that it is essential for what we do. And I think we need to start with changing our own practices if we really are serious about the challenges that we keep pointing out. And, and kind of embodying that future in these spaces, yeah. Now, Martin, I know you wanted to ask Nika and Sietze something, so if you can come up here, I'll just move out of your way. Um, just thank you so much from me as well, and over to you, Martin. Yeah. No, so, so one of the things that I was really insistent on is also to break away with our habit of constantly talking. And when I, when I met you two, I, I was really overwhelmed, I must say, but what you bring to the fore. And I want to ask you, Ninke, um, you've sort of evolved and, and, and came up with the album Plant, and you find yourself often in very different situations than just in the theater with people expecting music. Can you tell me something or, and the audience about um, what you think is happening, why people respond so directly to, for instance, uh, your ancestor? Ooh, um, well, uh, what we try to do with the album plant is to offer uh, different perspectives on the situation where we're in now. And I think music is always a great means to help because it opens another part of the brain, you know, it, get it, it gets immediate to the emotional level. So that helps a lot. Um, and we tried, yeah, with, um, you know, uh, if, if, if you want to change yourself or your worldview, that's something quite big. Uh, but then it can help, we thought, to offer different perspectives. So, uh, for instance, to take the perspective of a tree, where we started with how uh, would a tree look upon us? And if you look through their eyes, you look differently to yourself. For instance, to look back from the future to ourselves with your ancestor. Uh, uh, how would our great-grandchildren look upon us? And that's what we tried with this album. So it, we also went uh, ourselves from all those emotions, from uh, despair to hope to, uh, well, uh, uh, frustration and ultimately to love in the last song. That is the thing I think that binds us. And uh, well, uh, so that's the journey we went through in theaters, but also in conferences like this. I, I'm deeply appreciative, and I'm sure the, the audience was uh, too. Sietze, um, you've been also on a journey with Teunus Spiersma, who is one of our uh, you know, Spinoza-winning uh, uh, academics. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a bit about how you experienced that collaboration between art and, and, and science? The nice thing with Teunus is he's a biologist, and um, when he was a kid, he wanted to be a musician. And when I was a kid, I want to be a biologist. <laughs> so we turn it around. We find each other. I went uh, all over the world with him uh, to find birds while well, migrating, for example, the Greenland, Mauritania, China. And when we were in Mauritania in 2007, uh, that was my first expedition. And I was playing with orchestras, and I was in the Sahara. And at that moment, I thought, okay, this is what I want. 
I want my love for birds and landscape, I want that combined with film and music. So Tönis in that expedition changed my life. So I quit all the orchestras and at that moment we joining the stage with him and he's doing a lot of uh, research to migrating birds all over the world for 40 years, so there's a lot of data. And I am playing the music in this kind of yeah, performance together. So I start with music, he do the lecture, music, lecture, music. And in the end, we're playing together. And it's really, people are really crying when we uh, uh, tell the story about the godwit, the gruto, our national bird. It's really a declining story in this last 30 years. And people are really crying in the audience when, because the music is getting in your, into your heart and the data is getting into your brain. So this combination was, I think we played now for 15 years together from 2007 till now. So it was really um, a dream for me to get <laughs> the, the biologist <laughs> and for, he, uh, for him the same, so he's get yeah. a musician. So the top biologist combined with the top musicians, that is, yes. that is what we're after if we want to really trans transform. Um, thank you very much for being a keynote performer and I hope that idea of not only having keynote speakers also <laughs> sticks uh, in the, in the tr uh, 37 years that we have left until 2060. Thank you. thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Just if you can stay, just um, head on this way, move a little bit this way. Yeah, yeah. And now I'll invite uh, Dr. Lucy Kenji, Dr. Fatima Denton. If you just come around this way, we're going to come bring you right here. And I'm going to ask um, all of you, what was Beatrice, Alina, and uh, Harriet? What was your experience of putting together your thoughts and reflections from the perspective of 2060? What, did, what do you think we should learn from an approach like this, Beatrice? Yeah, for me, this doesn't fit any historical method that I normally work with. <laughs> so I felt that Martin Hager had done me a really nasty job. <laughs> and uh, so then I just let my imagination run, uh, run loose. And that was great to, to test on this audience. Great, thanks, Elina. Yeah, so for me, so it, I think it fits my uh, job a bit better to look more into the future, but I do think that, uh, so I mean, we, d we are all uh, in my field working on developing renewable technologies and maybe in the back of our minds we know that we are maybe um, entering a next crisis, which is the resource, the materials crisis. So when I was thinking about looking back in 2060, I felt that the me in 2023 should think about this really more also in my research, right? So that like I can find something really nice on a small scale, but if we want to implement it on a worldwide scale, we have to think about where do our materials come from. And it may work very nice in the lab, but if we are going to depend fully on China to make it, we may enter into new problems. So this is something I know in the back of my mind, but if I really have to think about 2060 and how it all changed, then it uh, yeah, increases importance to also think about this, yes. Thank you, we'll go to Harriet Fatima, then Lewis, Harriet. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I stepped in for, for Nikki Kratosowski, who sadly couldn't be with us at the last minute. So I haven't had very much time to think about the future, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did enjoy doing it as you saw. Um, yeah, I feel like we, as I'm a social scientist, I work on political science, geography background, and, and I think that we're very used to criticizing stories of technology that are too simple, but I think predominantly we work with stories of society that are too simple. We transfer all the things that we miss or we love about society now into the future and think that the future will be better if they are there. And I'm afraid that I don't agree. And I think that's why I kept mentioning shell and wolves and other things, because I think we need to, to make our stories of future societies much more complicated and learn to get um, used to the idea that our futures will be as uncomfortable as our presents. Uh, Dr. Denton, what was your experience from coming from a 2060 perspective? What do you think we can learn from that? Yes, it took, it took me a while to kind of get myself into that space. Um, I think it's a little bit uncomfortable, um, but 
it was very humbling, actually, because we always using words like leapfrogging. <laughs> you know, we talk about leapfrogging technologies. And I'm sort of thinking to myself, we need to leapfrog massively ourselves, our value systems. It seems like a lot of things that were said by yourselves, by Lewis, um, meant that there are so many things we need to get right. You know, so getting those things right and in what order, um, I think to me was like a lot of um, things to contain. Yeah, so, so I found this very, very humbling. I think it forces you to sort of say, what must we get right now? <laughs> you know, and how do we pace ourselves in the process? Yeah. Great. Dr. Lewis Akenji. Uh, yeah, what, what I was thinking about is that the first thing I was thinking was that I'm a grandpa and, and uh, <laughs> I wonder how my grandkids and my great grandkids are doing and, and uh, what, what, what kind of world did I contribute to or not contribute to. And, and then it became this really relieving space in which to play, but not to get unhinged from the science or unhinged from reality, but to imagine what would happen if all these ideas we're working on actually came true. Because there's a lot of fragments of possible futures that are floating around scientific bodies, traditional communities, in different spaces, but they're hardly ever really brought together in a constructive way that paints a picture of possibly what landscape we would be in. And what this allowed was to play with that a little bit, but also to also start seeing that although it's 40 years from now, there's an unease we've managed to tame and stay around 1.5, but we still run the risk of going above or even below. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's a utopia, it's just lots of elements are learning to coexist. It's still a journey and that is a fragility. It, it also shows that the, the huge challenge we have to get out of the mess that we've made. It's, in, it's incredible. Great, well, please join me in thanking again our speakers and our performers from this morning. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Emmy Reiter, who's the Managing Director of Pathways to Sustainability. And on behalf of Pathways to Sustainability, we have a, a gift for each of you, for Ninke, for Sitsa, yeah, and then for Fatima and Louis. So thank you all so, so much. Wonderful, thank you again. And um, I'll ask Martin to stay on the stage, but I welcome all the rest of you to join us in the front seats here. Uh, and the reason is because we now are gonna do something very exciting, which is the Pathways to Sustainability Award, which all of you in this room are actually going to choose who wins the award on Mentimeter today. Now you know this if you've been at past Pathways conferences, and really the idea is to have these best practices recognized. I'm gonna actually ask um, Martin to say a word about the Pathways Award, but as I do so, uh, I'm gonna actually invite our Rectus Magnificus, Henk Kummeling, who is also um, a professor, has been a professor of law at Tilburg and at Utrecht University. He was the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Economics and Governance. And he's been working with us on interdisciplinarity, education, internationalization, and embedding the university and society. So thank you so much for being here, Hank, who will be presenting the Pathways Award. Over to you, Martin. Why did we have the Pathways to Sustainability Award to begin with? Yeah, I think um, because it's so unclear uh, how we can get to a sustainable society, we need to also uh, acknowledge really good path-breaking research, in particular of uh, younger academics, because, uh, you know, Hank and his predecessors invented the strategic themes. Yeah. But, I mean, it's quite something that we are supposed to do. It's interdisciplinary, but also transdisciplinary with society. So if we then find uh, researchers that do precisely that, I think they should be put in the spotlight and uh, given a prize. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. Welcome, Rector Magnificus Hank Kulink, and I wanted to ask you, could you speak a little bit, because of the work you're doing, about the role of the university as an agent of change? Yeah, well, um, I think uh, out of necessity and out of a sense of responsibility, we, we have to be an agent of change. If we look at the state momentarily, the Dutch state especially, we have a lot of empty seats for state actors. The government is not acting, parliament is not acting, 
So there is definitely a need for, let's say, acting uh, on behalf, for instance, on the behalf of the climate. And I think, especially when, when you have so much combined knowledge like we have in a, a strategic theme like pathway sustainability, we have to stand up and we have to act and, and we have to, let's say, guide to a certain extent, uh, well, also our politicians to the, into the right direction, into 2060, I believe. So you have to go. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. And Hank, this is the award that you'll be handing to the award winner that we'll all choose. And we actually have representatives from each of the finalists. We have three finalists. So I'd like to invite Jack Davis from Deep Transitions, Ina Dorstein, and Jonas uh, Lampropoulos to come up to the stage. So come on up uh, to the stage now. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about each of these uh, different finalists. So Deep Transitions, Jack Davis is here. You know, they're really looking how the world needs investment in order to get to 1.5 degrees, but investing more is not enough. It's actually also about um, collaborating with a global panel of public and private investors to develop principles, tools, and metrics for financing transformative investment. So, Jack, here you are. I'm going to give you this microphone. Deep transitions, investments, how is this a seed of the future? I'm going to give this over to you. Yeah, okay, so huge question. Um, essentially, what we've been trying to do is to bring the concepts of transformation and systems change uh, into the world of investment. And, uh, you know, trying to figure out what the role of investors actually is within these processes. So it's not as simple as just throwing more money at uh, opportunities to maybe uh, build something new for the future. It's much more involved than that. And investment has kind of historically been this engine driving uh, the expansion of the global economy, and that included driving expansion of enclosure, extraction, and the degradation of the natural world. But it really doesn't need to be like that. Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that engine of, of investment and turn it towards the challenge of, yeah, building a, a different future. Great, thank you so much, Jack. So that's deep transitions. We're about to show you a ment Mentimeter. You're gonna vote on which one will win the award. But now we're gonna turn over to you, Ina Durstein. Uh, Tipping the Iceberg is the name of the project. It's about leveraging a food transition for indigenous communities in the Bering Sea. How is this a seed for the future, Ina? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, first I would like to say I'm here on behalf of um, Celia Zimmerman. And um, well, she's the PhD student that is leading this uh, project, uh, but she's currently abroad preparing for the field season. So how is this a seed uh, for the future? Um, yeah, there's many, especially in the Arctic, the indigenous communities are really suffering from multiple challenges. And it's a really complex problem for them to be food secure in the future. So they have a lot of problems, of course, with climate change, with natural resources that are declining, but also they have a long legacy of uh, marginalization. And so in this project, uh, together with the, with the tribal council, together with the local community, we are really looking at paths towards the future. So how can they become more food secure? Great, thank you so much, Ina. So that's seeds for the future, or sorry, tipping the, the iceberg. Now we're gonna talk about Jonas Lampropoulos' uh, project and his teammates called GAME. It's a long-term consumer and community empowerment in energy applications project using inclusive game design, artificial intelligence, and systems modeling. Why is this a seed for the future? Thank you. Game is actually a word play, so we use the G and the A, like going for a goal. So life is not a game, but we hope with this application to make a change in real life. We try to provide a connection to the people to participate, let's say, in all these developments that happen in the energy markets, and also to transition to a sustainable future. And okay. Actually, we connect the electricity meters, a lot of technologies. It's a great team. It's an inter-faculty collaboration for faculties at our university from social sciences, humanities, geosciences, and science. And uh, we're just starting embarking this uh, amazing journey. We hope to make a change. Great, thank you so much. So now what we're gonna do is take out your phones. You'll see the, the Mentimeter coming up because you're gonna actually vote between uh, deep transitions on investment and finance, 
uh, game that Jonas was just speaking about um, around the energy transition and community empowerment and the tipping the iceberg around in leveraging food transitions for indigenous communities in the Bering Sea. Now I'm going to just let you know that we actually have a video, so we'll watch the, the videos. Community oh, it's already happening. Watch the videos for more. To address the Here's poly John. crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and global inequality. But simply adding more money might not be enough to achieve the kind of systemic change that we require. To address this challenge, we worked in partnership with a global panel of 16 front-running public and private investors, co-creating new principles, tools, and metrics for financing long-term systemic change. The result is transformative investment, a new approach with the potential to unlock the engine of investment for sustainability. With this first phase of the project complete, we are now launching the Deep Transitions Lab, a transdisciplinary space in which investors and researchers come together to experiment with applying transformative investment in practice. Your vote will help us to make transformative investment the new norm and to push the leading edge of academic knowledge through catalyzing real-world impact. Thank you for your support. Energy costs for households have increased dramatically over the past period, and often energy markets lack transparency for end users. At the same time, the transition to sustainable energy is more urgent than ever. In these challenging times, people can contribute to solutions, but often something is missing to empower citizens. With our project, we stimulate long-term efficient energy use in households via an energy game app. By connecting the household's energy meters into the game, combined with artificial intelligence, people can take actions in real life, such as using the washing machine when the sun is shining, and learn how to use more sustainable energy and save money. Our consortium has a unique inter-faculty collaboration and partners across the whole energy system. We will provide our application to citizens across the country and explore replicability at European level. With emphasis on learning communities and co-design activities, we place the citizens at the core of the energy transition in an easy and playful way. Climate change, high food prices or loss of knowledge. Arctic indigenous communities are suffering from many complex challenges in their food systems. But how can we navigate such complexities and pave the way towards a future of increased food security? St. Paul is a small island community in the middle of the Bering Sea where food prices are extremely high and many subsistence species are suffering from climate change or overfishing. In the Tipping the Iceberg project, together with the local community, we set up a so-called transformation lab to learn about the food system and find solutions to these challenges. We use inclusive and participatory approaches like indigenous storytelling sessions or engaging in subsistence activities to learn from each other. Based on our shared understanding of the food system, we then think about what a more positive future could look like and how we could reach it. Using such approaches helps us find ways in which the community can create collective action to tackle the challenges they face. If you vote for us, you help the St. Paul Island community to get one step closer towards a future of increased food security. Okay, now it's over to you. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna bring up the Mentimeter code. You're gonna vote for one that is going to win this year's Pathways to Sustainability Award. When we announce it, the winner will come forward and Hank and Barton will congratulate you. Then all the finalists come here. We're gonna take a photograph looking this way. So we'll turn all the lights up in the hall already. If we could just turn the lights up, then we can see everybody. Meanwhile, you're voting. And, um, and we're about to hear the drum roll for, for the big moment of uh, the Pathways to Sustainability Award. So if we can have the house lights up as well um, whenever you've got a moment. Great, yeah, that's perfect. All right, I'm gonna look over to Simone to see how we're doing in terms of 
the Orfemka in terms of the votes coming in. I think I can see. Are we ready? We've got 223. Can you see the number over there? I'm still seeing a few votes coming in. This is your last chance. Hold on, I'm hearing. Ready, the drum roll. When it hits 325, we're gonna go for it. Almost, almost. And 22, 25, all right. And the winner of this year's Pathways to Sustainability Award is, brrr, I'm gonna be a drum. Brrr, let's reveal it behind me. It is, oh. Tipping the iceberg, come on forward. <laughs> Wonderful, well now I'm gonna ask you to stand, we're gonna have the photographer join us, all of you and um, in the audience, we're gonna do this in a moment, so uh, what we'll do is have the other finalists come to me on this side, and we'll put you in a send. Uh, oh yes, oh wonderful. <laughs> Great, and if Hank comes join Martin on this side. Okay, so everyone behind me, and the photographer will call it out. So do you want to do a three, two, one for the group? Yes, everyone just hands in the air. Oh, fabulous, here we go. Okay, I want to see more hands. More hands. <laughs> yes, we can all get a shout out, yes award. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much. A big thank you and congratulations to all of you. Wonderful, thanks Martin, wonderful. Well, now we've got the overview of the program, so I'm gonna ask the slides to come up. We have something very special that's happening over the lunch. There are, is a side program taking place um, in which you can actually take a look at a whole bunch of really exciting programs and projects. There is a climate casino, and you can see that that's just where you're getting coffee in Park 6. Test your knowledge about the climate, and maybe your name will end up on a wall of fame. So this is during lunch. You can also play the Sustainable Futures video game, so you can come play games that explore different sustainable futures. They're designed by students from Utrecht University and the HAKEU, the Utrecht University of the Arts. Um, also in the Park Six is the Living Lab game. How can you create, co-create real life experimentation that moves beyond traditional project methods and allows for future-proofing, innovation, and dynamic processes. So you can come learn together in the Living Lab game. And then also down the stairs in the HK, okay, F Hein Foyer, um, we have people bringing people down there as well. Go to the Urban Nature Book Corner. Take a break from it all, dream away, enjoy your imagination. You can also go to the Future Proofing Education and, Enge and, and Engagement um, uh, booth. What were the biggest educational changes in the decades between now and 2060? Go find out and help develop the future of education and impact at Utrecht University. You may want to go to the round table of time troublers. Please join for an intimate gathering with temporal agents who traveled from the past and the future to meet you in Utrecht. And then you can also be uh, doing some matchmaking for lifelong learning within sustainability. So what do professionals in the sustainability transition encounter and what do they want to learn? And perhaps you're ready for a climate confessional, an interactive performance that invites you to explore the role of subjectivity in climate science. So that's just down the stairs. Once you have your boterham, your, your lunch, you can bring it down and go and participate. So this is, these are the two places for lunch. And by the way, these will not be there at the reception. So this is your time. This is your moment to go in and check those out. Um, there's also volunteers in yellow that will be able to guide you there and also to the breakout rooms. So let's look at those now. On your um, name tag, you'll see which breakout session you've signed up to. Transformative research and education is right here in Hertz. And then you can reflect on your theory of change. Art, science, collaboration, and social change, again, is down those foyer stairs. Materials and energy in 2060 is in cloud nine. Um, sorry, yes, cloud nine. And um, so those ones you'll see are um, up the stairs. You can see them in blue up at the top. 
Uh, nat uh, Nature a City, the Everyday Narratives of Urban Futures is in Pandora. Woohoo! Whose Ocean, Different Voices Heard, is in Club Nine. It's Cloud Nine and Club Nine, and they're both up the blue stairs. Destination Symbiocene, Living in Mutual Benefit with Nature in the Western Netherlands, is in Pandora Foyer. So you see them there. If you have any questions, people in yellow, they'll guide you there. After the afternoon sessions, we'll meet back where you've had coffee and tea at 4 o'clock for a reception and a short goodbye and a thank you and a recap of some of the key ideas from, that, from these sessions. I want to just take a moment now, because we won't be gathering in this room again, I want to say a big thank you to Martin Heyer for the curation of today, to Emmy Geiger, who's part of the, the key leader on the managing um, the Pathways to Sustainability program, Joanne, Femke, Sigrid, Louise, Simone, Manuela, Chantal, Harold, Margot, Sophie, Cataline, Marit, Dan, Emmy, Charlotte, Monique, Stefan, and the community managers, organizers, and speakers at the breakout sessions, all of the speakers, organizers, and helpers of the lunch activities, and here in this hall in Tivoli, Ariane, the stage manager, Jeff, um, and uh, Miguel on audio, um, uh, Joel, sorry, Joel and Jeff on audio, Aziz and Miguel on lights, um, and also to Tim, Celine, Femke, Tobias, and Jelmer, and everyone who's made this conference possible. So a big round of applause for all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so the lunch is vegan. It is in park, um, in park six just out the way. Now these breakout groups start promptly at two o'clock. It takes a while to get to some of them. So you might want to start heading there at quarter to two. Find someone new you haven't met before. Talk about them about 2060. Some of you will be returning to 2060 in your breakout sessions. Enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you very much.